So welcome to Operating Systems Lecture 8. Right. So, so far we have been looking at how uh, an operating system implements the abstractions that it does. And uh, the first abstraction we looked at was the address space. And we said, look, segmentation is one way to implement address spaces. And uh, there is something, there's a structure called a global descriptor table, which lives in uh, the physical memory. It is roughly of the size 2 to the power 13, um, which is perhaps the reason why it's, it should live in the physical memory, right? Because the chip will not have that much capacity to be able to store large structures like this. So structures like this, which are relatively large, need to be stored somewhere else. And the typical place they're stored in is memory, right? And then, but on the processor, you have this uh, register, which is called the global descriptor table register, which points to this GDT. And that's how the hardware knows where to look for when it's, uh, when it's actually tra executing the MMU operations, right? Now these segment, these registers, code segment, data segment, et cetera, these are called the segment registers. And within them, they store the segment selectors, right? Depending on the instruction, a virtual address will choose one of these registers. For example, if, it's, if you are dereferencing the instruction pointer, you will go through the CS register. If you are dereferencing uh, you know, any regular data, the default segment will be the data segment. So you will dereference the DS register. If you are dereferencing uh, the stack through ESP or EBP point, uh, registers, then the default segment will be SS register. So there are certain regist uh, default segments. And then you can over also override the default segments by explicitly specifying that this is the segment register that I want to use for this particular address. In, a, in any case, the segment selector is used to index into the GDT, right? So the, the algorithm inside the hardware is that it'll first dereference GDTR. Uh, it'll first read GDTR to find the address of GDT, you know, add the selector to that value to understand where exactly the descriptor lives, read the descriptor, get the corresponding base and limit values, perform the appropriate operation of PA is equal to VA plus base, and checking if VA is less than limit. And if these checks succeed, it actually uses the computed physical address to index the physical memory. All right, question. So is the value of GDTR read at every memory access instruction? Is the value of GDTR read at every memory access instruction? That's a great question. In other words, for every memory access, do I make another memory access? So does, does every memory access that a program makes does the hardware need to make two memory access, one to the GDT and then one to the real physical address? Well, uh, logically speaking, yes, but actually no, because uh, you know these entries get cached inside the chip, right? So there are uh, you know there are semantics on uh, you know when the cache get ca when the caching takes place and when it gets invalidated, and let's ignore that discussion for now. But you you can imagine that you know the select the descriptors for all the six segments that are present on the CPU, they just get cached inside the CPU. So you don't have to go over the bus every time to access the GDT descriptor, right? So that's an, that's an optimization. But let's look at the semantics for now. All right. So each segment descriptor has a base and limit, and it also has uh, permissions, which basically says, at which privilege level am I allowed to go through this segment, all right? So the privilege level is determined by the lowest two bits of the CS register. So if the lowest two bits of the CS register are zero, which means I'm executing in privilege mode, I can, um, you know, I can access any of the configured segment descriptors here, uh, or I can dereference through any of the segment descriptors. On the other hand, if it's three, then I can only dereference segment descriptors that have uh, permission set to three, right, or unprivileged. All right. So. All right, so, so far so good. Uh, basically, this, what this allows you to do is every process will have a private address space. Nobody else can touch it. The OS will have its own protected address space. No process can touch it. And moreover, each process has a uniform address space, you know, starting at zero, for example. Right? So you do, the process, the, the, the compiler or the linker does not need to be worried about where the process will actually get loaded. So the loader and the linker can become completely independent in some sense. All right. The next thing we said was, look, that's fine. Uh, a process, this is how operating system implements address spaces for processes. But uh, a process needs to do more. In particular, there needs to be a way for a process to make a system call. There needs to be a way for the OS to actually take control away from the process uh, on some external event, like an 
interrupt from an external device or an interrupt from a timer device, for example, especially because uh, I need to implement protection. So one process should not be able to run away with the CPU. So I should be able to uh, run after every uh, predefined time interval. Moreover, I should be able to get control if uh, the process performs any illegal action, like divide by zero, segmentation violation. So the, the, the word segmentation fault act, actually you know, uh, uh, has historical roots in, uh, in the segmentation procedure. So if a segmentation fault means that you violated the segmentation rules. right? So you actually tried to exceed the limit, and so you violated the segmentation rules, and that's how you know that's why it's probably called segmentation fault. All right. So, so for, to facilitate uh, this and uh, and also system calls, there's a mechanism called the interrupt descriptor table, or IDT, as I'm going to call it. And the idea is that in case of an event uh, which involve which is either an external event that a device needs attention, it asserts the interrupt pin. Or it's an internal inter event that the uh, application actually executed something illegal or the exceptional condition. Then you know the processor is going to stop execution there for the process and look into the IDT to figure out where is the handler of this particular condition. Right? The condition could be an external device asserting something, or the condition could be internal. In either case, uh, there'll be a number associated with that particular condition, and that's that number is called the interrupt vector. So the interrupt vector will determine which entry in this IDT should be dereferenced. And that entry is going to be used to find the program counter of the handler. Right? So the, each descriptor in the interrupt descriptor table contains a pair, uh, code segment, and EIP, which is basically a pointer to the handler of that particular condition. Right? So for example, if, um, if, you know, if the if the network device in, uh, asserted the interrupt pin and you have assigned it number two, then you know you should have the network device handler at this particular address. Or if you if there was a segmentation violation, then you should have the segmentation fault handler at this location and all. And these handlers will typically do what? They will either you know execute the device driver logic in case it's a it's an external interrupt, or if it's an exceptional condition, they will uh, execute the appropriate uh, logic to deal with that exceptional condition. So for example, if it was a segmentation fault, the operating system could say, let's just kill the process. All right? Or it could convert that uh, exception into a signal and pass it on as a signal to the Unix process. Right? And recall what a signal is. A signal is nothing but uh, interrupting the process execution and making a call to the signal handler of the process. Right? So in some sense, the abstraction of Unix signals is is very much inspired from what happens at the hardware level in terms of exceptions and interrupts. Right? So an interrupt also causes a handler to get executed, and uh, and the signal got. Uh, but in this case, it's a hard, it's an interrupt handler. In case of a process, it was a signal handler, which was the process had registered. The process was able to register signal handlers for itself. Similarly, the operating system should be able to register interrupt handlers or exception handlers for itself. The, the, the mechanism to be able to register signal handlers is provided by the OS. The mechanism to register interrupt handlers or exception handlers is provided by the hardware, right? Okay. All right. So, so we understand uh, um, handlers uh, so far. The other inter, uh, important thing is that the, compute, the code segment could actually be a privileged code segment. So even if I'm executing in unprivileged mode, if this code segment has last two bits set to privilege, which is zero, then you know when the interrupt is going to occur, it's going to start executing in privilege mode, and that's required because you want that uh, you know whatever code you're going to have for device drivers or for uh, exceptional conditional handling should run in privileged mode, right? So, so the hardware designers provide that facility because by allowing you to specify any CSA. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so with that, let's look at what happens if uh, you know if. So before I start, um, an interrupt or an exception. So an in, I, I use the word interrupt for anything that's f from an external source, like external device, like a timer or a, you know, a disk or whatever. And I use the term exceptions for something internal, like a segmentation fault or uh, or a divide by zero, etc., <coughs> or an illegal instruction was executed, etc. So an illegal instruction is executed. One example would be a process tried to execute the a privilege instruction, like LGDT, 
right? So we saw that loading the GDTR is a privileged instruction. If you're running in unprivileged mode and the process tries to execute the, the privileged instruction, LGDT, right? You recall the LGDT instruction, which uh, loads the GDTR. You're going to do, the process is not going to be allowed to do that, and what will happen is an exception will get raised, and the operating system will come into action, and it'll decide what to do with the process, right? All right, and uh, another thing, the IDT itself is also stored in memory. Once again, IDT is a relatively large structure, cannot be stored on chip uh, completely. So rather, the IDT is stored in memory, and there's a pointer called IDTR inside the chip, which basically says where to look for IDT, just like GDT. All right. So now let's say I get a trap. So I'm going to I'm going to use the word trap as a general term for interrupts or exceptions. So I could get an interrupt, I could get an exception. Let's just call them a trap. So the question. So the entry in the IDT. Can we change the entry in the IDT? Let's hold that thought for a moment. That's a great question. But uh, let's let's just first understand how this works, and then we'll talk about security. You know, what can the, what should be a process be able to do, and what it should not be able to do such that uh, you know, it's not able to gain control of the system. So let's say I get a trap in kernel mode. <coughs> kernel, or you, know, you can also say privilege mode. Right? So I'm going to use uh, privilege, unprivilege, or kernel user, uh, same thing. Right? So kernel is privilege mode, kernel mode is privilege mode, and user mode is unprivileged mode. So what happens is, Let's say I was executing and a trap occurred. So what will happen is, let's say this was my stack pointer. This was the, the value of my stack pointer. As soon as a trap occurs, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the old values of CS and old value of EIP. And I'm going to set my CS and EIP registers to the values that I get from the interrupt descriptor table. And I'm going to now start executing. Right? So I got the trap in the kernel mode. I, looked, I used the ESP value at that time to push the old values on the stack. And now I, use, I start executing the interrupt handler. Right? This is very similar to how signal handling was happening. Right? A signal comes, you, st you just execute at, as a, as a as a function call, as an asynchronous function call. Similarly, this is doing a similar thing. You know, an interrupt came or a trap happened. You just executed the handler as an asynchronous function call, using the same stack that the kernel was using. Right? Okay. Another matter of detail: apart from CS and EIP, it also stores old E flags. Right? So the interrupt descriptor table entry could also potentially contain a uh, flags register, or certain flags. And uh, when the interrupt gets, uh, actually starts to run, uh, the semantics are that you're going to replace not just CS and EIP, you're also going to replace certain flags, some flags. Right? So before you start execution of the interrupt handler at this point, you're also going to replace so some flags with the values that are present in the descriptor. And because you're going to change things, you also need to save them. And once again, you save them on the stack. Right? So this is clear? Uh, so this is stored in the kernel stack. This is, yeah. So we are talking about a trap received in kernel mode. So let's say there's, a, there's, an, there's an interrupt while I was executing in privileged mode. This is what will happen. So it'll, not, it'll just push things on whatever the value of ESP is currently. OK? Don't we require storing general purpose registers? Yes, we do require uh, saving more things. But this is the minimum that the hardware saves for you. And now the control has been transferred to the handler. And most likely, the first thing the handler is going to do is save the rest of the state. It may you. is a part of OS only. The handler is, yes, part of the OS. Uh, but uh, this transfer takes place via hardware. Via hardware, yes. See, basically, the hardware has to change the values of some registers to be able to execute the transfer. And so whichever registers it changes, whichever is the minimum set of registers it needs to change, those are the set of registers it saves. Other things, it doesn't need to change. It's really up to the software writer whether he needs to save them or not. Right? 
these kind of things the software writer won't have been able to save, right? Because you have to say where to execute the handler. And so before the, I mean, it's a chicken and egg problem, so the hardware has to come in into the middle and says, okay, these are the things I will save, and the rest of things you can save. So why is e-flags also there? Yeah, can't e-flags be actually handled by the handler Right, so there are certain flags, I'm gonna look, see later, which need to be saved by hardware. So can't, why can't e-flags be also saved in software, right? So there's a reason for that, and we're gonna discuss that later. Let's just, let's just uh, live with it for now. All right, so this is what happens on a trap entry. Right, and then you know the handler is going to uh, execute. Typically, the handler is going to execute on the same stack, so it, it's not going to change the stack value, right? So it's just like an asynchronous function call. Uh, you just execute the handler, and then you want to return from the handler, right? In case of a signal, when we saw for Unix, I just executed the return instruction, and I will get back to where I was, right? Because uh, the semantics of the signal entry were that the OS used to push the return address on the stack. And so when the signal handler used to call return, I used to pop the return address on the stack and get back to where I was, right? In this case, also, it's going to be similar, except that um, it's not a regular function call, so I cannot just use return to return, because uh, return is only, the semantics of the return instruction is that I just pop the stack and look at the EIP and that's it, right? I just pop the EIP and set that. It has nothing to do with CS and E flags. Yeah, recall re the return instructions. So we need a special instruction called interrupt return, IRET. In trap return, I'm gonna call it trap return. All right. And here, there's, if the ESP is pointing at this place, an interrupt return is going to pop the stack and uh, put this into put the first uh, value into EIP register, the second value into CS register, and the third value into E flags register, right? So this is the semantics of the irate instruction. What's gonna do is, it's going to look at the current stack pointer and pop, these, pop the first three words on the stack and fill these registers with those values, all right? So this is interrupt from, return from interrupt. Yes. Yes. So right now I'm talking about a trap in the kernel mode, right? So I because I was executing in the kernel mode already, so ESP is of the kernel, all right? So I'm already executing in the kernel mode, so ESP is trusted in this case. So I can I can do these things. Now next I'm going to talk about uh, traps in the user mode. This, that was the discussion that we ha we were having yesterday, right? Um, as a matter of additional detail. Uh, there are some vectors, there are some interrupt vectors, which actually push four words, all right? This is just a, just a matter of, uh, just a matter of the fact, really. There's no, uh, there's no fundamental behind it. But there are certain vectors for there which there are certain extra, uh, va there's one extra value that's pushed, that's the error code, all right? So for example, the page fault, or a sec, oh, sorry, a, so certain, uh, cert, for example, you can say, uh, you know, a certain exceptional condition could uh, additionally push this error code for the handler to know exactly why that exception occurred, right? So certain exceptions can occur because of various reasons, and so a cert, an extra value is pushed onto the stack to indicate that, right? So the, only the hardware knows exactly why this exception occurred. So one exception could actually be representing multiple conditions, and so error code basically, uh, tells you which of these conditions is actually the reason for that exception. What this means is because some vectors push the error code and others don't, the handlers need to be appropriately set up such that they understand this, right? So the, the handler for the vectors which push the error code will be set up to uh, know that an error code is already there and the handlers for which the vectors which do not push the uh, error code should know that uh, it's not there. Just to simplify things, Typically on x86, an OS handler will, you know, the, all the handlers for which the error code is not pushed, the handler will, the first thing it will do is just push a zero value there, so that the stack becomes uniform, right? So it can, it can assume a uniform stack frame, really. Right? So if, if there was no error code pushed by that vector, the OS in software will just push a zero for that particular, in that particular handler. 
So, uh, on return, the the irate instruction does not assume the presence of error code, all right? Irrespective of what happened here. So it's the responsibility of software to pop the error code before it calls irate. Okay. All right. Okay. Now let's look at a trap in user mode. Right? Or let's say unprivileged mode. Okay, once again, I was executing, and uh, here's my stack pointer. That's where it's pointing, and a trap occurred. Now, what should the kernel do? Can it do the same thing? Can it just push? So clearly, it needs to override certain registers. For example, it needs to override CS and EIP. Definitely, it also needs to override E flags. Okay. So now, question is, where does it push the old values of these registers? Because it needs them at interrupt return. So where does it push them? It wants to push them on stack, but can it just push them on this stack? Why? Because this particular value of this register is modifiable by the user, and the user could set it to anything which cannot be trusted. Right? I don't trust. So the model is that I don't trust the process. I don't trust the process in the sense that I won't let the process bring down the whole system. No matter what the process does, it should never be allowed to bring down the whole system. In this case, if the process had just set ESP to zero, for example, right, or some you know some uh, invalid address, and then um, right, so let's say ESP was set to zero, and then it executed some exceptional condition which caused a trap, then what will happen is the kernel will try to push on a full stack, right? Zero cannot be decremented any further, and so it will get into an infinite. Um, Exceptional condition, and the, the CPU will actually halt. Right, so that's not that's not acceptable. So what I'm going, so, so what's really needed is that on a, if you receive a trap in user mode, you should also switch the stack pointer before you start pushing things. Right, so so what happens is on a trap, it actually switches to another stack, and that stack is let's say ESP zero. And then on that stack, it's going to start pushing things. Right? Notice that because I'm modifying more registers now, unlike the previous case where I was just modifying uh, CS and EIP, I'm now also modifying ESP. In fact, I'm also modifying SS. Right? So the, uh, the semantics are that I'm going to modify the entire virtual address, uh, which is represented by SS colon ESP. So initially, if it was SS colon ESP, now it becomes SS0 colon ESP0. And so I need to save the old values of uh, SS and ESP, and I'm going to do that on this stack. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push five bytes here, and I'm going to say, let's say, mm, old SS, old ESP, old E-flags. Old CS and old EIP. Right? So these are the things that the hardware saves for you. And now the interrupt handler is set up to be able to run in a secure environment. So it has a secure stack that I didn't trust, and it has it, it is on the right instruction pointer, and now it can start running and it may want to save more things. And typically what it'll also save those things on the same stack on which it was started. Right, because this is, a this is a trusted stack, anyways. Okay. The second one is the kernel stack. The second one is the kernel stack. This was a user stack. All right. Now, now what happens if uh, when the kernel executes the irate instruction? So the, now the interrupt handler will execute, or the trap handler will execute in the, in the, on the kernel stack, and eventually it will want to return. And it should actually return to exactly the same point in the user space where it actually left off, right? So once again, it's going to call the irate instruction. And the semantics of the irate instruction is, is going to, once again, let, 
you know let's say this was the esp at this point it's going to pop up the first three words and set up set those up as cseip and e flags just like before but now it's going to see that oh the cs is actually a an unprivileged cs right so the cs that it's actually popping into the uh, into the register is actually an unprivileged cs it can see that from its value and so it's going to realize that because it because i transition from a privileged to an unprivileged i'm transitioning back from a privileged to an unprivileged mode there must have been two more words that have must have been pushed and so it also pops off those those two words and actually pops off five words to set to basically re reload these registers back again right so in the previous exam, uh, case i rate was just popping three three values in this case i rate is popping five values how does i rate know how many values to pop by looking at the value that was popped in the first three words right or pop, by looking at the value of the second word right that contains the cs okay all right and so when you execute the i rate instruction you are actually going to get back to the user stack right because you have changed the value of ss and esp so you are actually now going to start executing in the user stack with the at exactly the same eip at which you left off okay all right okay okay so now let's talk about security so what prevents a user from being able to take control of the system so we said a user can is basically sandboxed within his own address space because firstly he cannot uh, modify gddtr secondly we said the gdt itself should live in a portion of memory that's not accessible by the user right and thirdly um, these the values of these selectors can only be set to one of the values that have been put in the gdt right and the os should be careful that it only puts the uh right values or permissible values in the gdt right so that's how i was ensuring that a user is not able to jump out of its address space question in this one how do we ensure in the kernel mode that esp never become zero okay okay good question so how do we ensure that the in the kernel mode esp never becomes zero or esp never underflows right or i never run out of stack so this is the this is something that an os designer has to be careful about nothing in this world is nothing is infinite right infinite so even in the user mode a stack is never infinite it's just an illusion of infinity right so if you ever try to cross your boundaries you are going to uh, if a process ever crosses its boundaries it's going to get a segmentation fault okay and os is should ideally never cross its boundaries so the os designer should write his os in such a way that there is a bound to the maximum stack stack length that you can have all right i'm going to see how that's done so an os designer or an os writer or kernel developer has an extra bound that you know you cannot grow the stack too much there's a maximum bound to how much a stack can be typically a stack would be for example the linux kernel has a stack of uh, one page uh, of around 4000 bytes or maybe even 8000 bytes right so between 4000 to 8000 bytes are enough in general for a stack right even your xv6 kernel which we uh, we're going to we're going to look at an academic kernel called xv6 later it also has you know 4000 uh, 4096 bytes of stack and that's enough for most folks okay all right okay so so we we saw how uh, this is basically saying that a uh, a program can never jump out of its address space it's also saying that a program can never execute an instruction uh, which is privileged because i'm going to run it in the privileged mode etc okay and a program can never lower its privilege level so once you have set up the privilege of the cs register i cannot just lower the privilege level but we also saw that uh, the idt is a way for the process to actually lower its privilege level right so for example i can just execute some exceptional condition and i'll now be executing in privileged mode so the first thing is that the os should ensure that all these entries all the handlers of the idt are uh appointing all the entries in the idt are pointing to valid values if one of these idt values is pointing to some garbage 
then an OS can actually cause that particular vector to get fired, and you are going to actually uh, try to execute some in invalid instruction, and the system can get down. Right? The first thing is the IDT itself should have completely sane values. The second thing is the instruction to load the IDT, which is the LIDT instruction, which just loads the IDTR, should be a privilege instruction, right? A user shouldn't be able to just say LIDT. Okay? Because if the user can say LIDT, then he can just take control of what gets executed in privilege mode. So the instruction LIDT should be a privilege instruction. All right? The third thing is that the IDT itself should live in the OS address space. It should not be able to, it should not be visible to the any process. Okay? So only the OS can set up these values. The OS needs to be very careful about setting up these, up these values so the user cannot take advantage of any bugs in the OS. Plus, you basically ensure that this structure is not modifiable by the process. Okay? All right? Okay. Um, yes, question. Okay, is it possible that a process wants to handle and interrupt in a different way than an other process? It is a matter of what abstractions the OS is providing to the process. In the abstraction that we've seen so far, that's not possible. A process has no idea what an interrupt means, right? It only understands system calls and signals, okay? So it doesn't make sense to say that a one process should be able to, con to control the handler of a particular interrupt, right? The, a process can control the uh, handling of a particular signal, right? So that's, uh, that's the difference. Of course, you know, so what you, have, what you have put is you put a layer in between the hardware and the process, and you have said that this is, these, are, these are the permitted things that you can do, and I'm going to implement those things. Right? And uh, we have seen one type of abstraction, that are the Unix abstractions. And then there are other types of abstractions uh, which actually allow the thing, kind of thing that you are saying. All right? And uh, there are performance advantages to be able to do that. Right? But it also makes things more complex and um, et cetera. And we are going to look at those trade-offs later on. OK. All right. So In this figure, when I said that when a trap is received in user mode, I actually switch the stack to SS0 and ESP0. There's a minor matter of detail, where does the hardware get these values, SS0 and ESP0 from? Right? So there needs to be some way of telling the processor that look, these are the values of SS0 and ESP0. Before, you actually, before the OS actually gives control to the user, he should set up SS0 and ESP0 appropriately so that if a trap occurs while the process was executing, the hardware knows that this is what you should load. Right? And on x86, uh, there's a structure called task state segment. Which allows you to do this. And there are more details they're going to find out in your programming assignment. So I'm not going to go into detail. Let's just, for the purposes of, the, uh, of, of our discussion, let's just assume that there's some place where you can store these values and tell the hardware that here's where you should pick up these values from, right? When you get an interrupt in user mode. Okay. All right. Um, another thing I would uh, I'd point out is that. Notice that when I'm talking about the semantics of instructions like irate, while the, IRAT, the semantics have been designed in such a way that they complement or they bracket the operation at an interrupt entry, or they, you know, so whatever the interrupt entry is doing, irate is undoing. But actually, irate exists as a separate instruction in itself, right? Which has these semantics that's going to pop off the first three words and uh, load them into these registers, and depending on its values, maybe pop off two more words, etc. So actually, between the execution of the entry, between the entry and the return, the interrupt handler could potentially modify these values. 
for whatever reason. Typically, it will not modify these values, but sometimes it may. Right? One example where it may modify these values is, for example, when you want to set up the first process. Or let's say when you implement the fork system call. Right? So what happens in a fork system call? Uh, OK, before we discuss that, let's also talk about how system calls are implemented. We discussed that yesterday, but let's just review that. So apart from interrupts and exceptions, there are also something called software interrupts. <coughs> These are interrupts that the, uh, that the program can actually invoke. So instead of some exceptional condition happening or some external device saying that I want an interrupt to get in handler to get executed, the program itself could execute an instruction like int 3, it's a one byte instruction, or int o, which basically says, invoke this particular interrupt or trap. The semantics is that this is going to uh, simulate an interrupt of vector 3. Right? This is going to simulate an interrupt of ve vector whatever O stands for, overflow in this case. Right? The semantics for this is that uh, this is basically used for debugging. So this is the breakpoint. Right? So, if you have wondered how GDB works, for example, one, uh, you know, it basically, so if you put a breakpoint at some point, you say, I want to stop the execution at this particular point, right, at this particular value of the instruction pointer. What GDB does, one way to do that is basically that G GDB writes this particular instruction, int 3, on that particular byte. So let's say I wanted to get uh, interrupted at EIP 1000. So what GDB is going to do is it's going to write int 3 instruction at 1000. It's going to replace the original contents of that, value, uh, EIP, uh, of that uh, memory location and put int 3 there. What will happen is when the, uh, when the program gets executed, as soon as it reaches that point, it's going to execute int 3 and an interrupt is going to get simulated. The interrupt handler will be the OS interrupt handler. And in this case, the interrupt handler will know that this is a breakpoint interrupt handler. The breakpoint interrupt handler, let's say, what it does is it converts the exception into a signal that it gives to the GDB process. And so the GDB has installed a signal handler, which basically says, OK, stop execution and return back to the user with a prompt and ask for the, uh, for the next command from the user. Right? So this is one way of implementing breakpoints. Right? So a good example of why software interrupts are used. Okay? Similarly, in interrupt overflow is an overflow condition. So this basically says that if, you know, if, if in the E flags register, the overflow bit is set, then cause an interrupt. So the, the way the hardware designers imagined this to be used is basically you perform some computation, and then you execute the into instruction. So if the execution actually created an overflow, it will cause an interrupt. If it didn't cause an overflow, it will not cause an interrupt. And so the idea is in the common case when there was no overflow, you will just you know, very quickly go to the next instruction. You don't have to have if then else kind of uh, logic in your code. So this makes, gives you a very nice, very, a fast way of doing this kind of exceptional condition handling. Right? And of course, then there is the normal int instruction, which can take any vector number. And this can basically say, simulate this particular interrupt. Right? And this is what we use for system calls. So example, a particular vector number, let's say you know, the Linux kernel had been using uh, the, the number 128 or hexadecimal 80 to, uh, to, to do the system call. So it basically means if a process makes int $0x80, it's going to simulate an interrupt at vector 0x80. And the, the handler at 0x80 is going to assume that a system call was made. It's going to also assume that the arguments of the system call and the system call name itself is stored in certain places. For example, it's stored in the registers. And so it's going to read the values of the register to figure out what, the argue, what, what, what system call I need to execute. For example, exec, fork, et cetera. And what were the arguments for it, to it? Right? For example, the, the address of the string for exec, et cetera. OK. So system calls are also implemented by using this interrupt descriptor table structure. And, um, OK. And so, and as, and so uh, we were discussing how IRET can be used. So we said that IRET can actually 
Islet has just the semantics, and, uh, and a handler may want to actually change these values before the interrupt runs. And one example where you would do that is the fork system call. Right? What happens on a fork system call? You make a system call. The handler is a system call handler. It figures out that you're trying to call fork. What it does is it creates a new address space and copies your address space into the new address space. One way to create a new address space is get, that much, get the same amount of memory in physical memory. Right? Copy all the contents. Set, set up a new base and limit in your uh, internal data structures. And, um, and set up the stack in this way, such that EIP, CS, EFLAGS, ESP, SS is identical to how it was in the process which called the fork, with the only difference being that the return value should be different, right? So how does it do that? Where is the return value uh, stored? Yeah, let's say it's, uh, it's a, uh, the return value of the system call is in the EX register, so it just changes the value of the EX register and executes the irate instruction. So it sets up a new stack, it copies these values, it maybe changes some register and causes irate. Right? Another way you know, a, a fork system call could potentially return is basically you know, store the value on stack. Right? So let's say the return value is coming on stack, even that's possible. What, what, the, what the handler will need to do in the new process is dereference the stack pointer of the user and maybe change some values there before calling irate. Right? And so the stack will actually see new values, slightly different values, let's say. Okay? Similarly, you know, when the kernel boots, there's really no process. There's really no user mode. Everything is run, running in privileged mode. So when you create, to create the first process, you know, for example, the init process on, uh, on Linux, you know, what the kernel will do is it will just set up the stack in a certain way. It will set up the address space in a certain way, such that you know, a certain executable will be loaded in the address space. And now it will just call the irate instruction. And so now the first instruction of init starts executing. So even though init actually never existed before the irate, irate is basically simulating as though I'm returning back from a, from a system call that made. Right? So, Another, I mean, basically, a kernel can set up the, a fresh stack and still call irate, or it can modify these values and still call irate to, to implement desired functionality. But, but while booting, can't it just move the values that were created, CS and CIP, to move in substance instead of first putting with them on stack and then calling irate? Okay. Uh, can't it just uh, move? So you cannot just move into CS, right? There's no instruction which says move into CS. There's no instruction which says move into EIP. There are instructions like L jump, right? So uh, that's an interesting question. Can you just say L jump to this particular uh, value? And um, let's see, why is that not allowed? Mm. So you also need to change the stack. So you will basically need to load the stack from uh, the user mode to the kernel mode. And then you're going to call L jump. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, I believe it's not allowed in the processor, so you cannot just say L jump from one privilege level to another privilege level, right? But uh, let me let me confirm that. So exactly why the x86 architecture doesn't allow you to just do L jump, but more importantly, even this is an atomic operation, right? So you can just basically set up the stack and the EIP in one go as opposed to being doing it in multiple instructions. So first you will have to load the stack, and uh, after you have loaded the stack, you're still executing in privileged mode. And so that has also has its own security implications. You know, executing on an unprivileged stack in privileged mode has, it has its own problems. Right. How do we do that? That's easy, right? The parent can just return. So for the parent, it was just a system call, a regular system call, right? So just how, just like it returns from a regular system call, it's going to call irate and it's going to return from it. For the child, you need to create a fresh stack. When you call irate for the parent, the kernel has, the kernel has Right. So, so here's the process. It made a system call, right? The system call basically internally figured out it's a fork, and so it created new state, it created a new stack, 
It added a new process to its list of processes. And now it just calls irect on the original stack. Right? So the, pro the parent can just continue as it is. Right? And now the child, on the other hand, will, get, will continue in, on its new stack. So you don't call it irect on the child? We call irect on both, right? So only one process enters the kernel, and two processes exit the kernel. And the stack. So we are comp copying the entire address space, and we are setting up the stack pointer to be identical. So that basically means you're copying the stack also. But there's only one kernel stack, right? Uh, OK, I see. So what, basically, OK, so now, now you're asking how many kernel stacks there are. Right, so that's your question. Good. So, sorry. OK, so how? So there are two ways a kernel is implemented. One is uh, the process model. Where there is a kernel stack, separate kernel stack. Per process, right? So in this case, what will you do on a fork? You'll create a new kernel stack and you'll copy the entire kernel stack. So apart from the user address space, which has nothing to do with the kernel stack, you're good, right? And so you're going to have a separate process uh, kernel stack per process. Right? So when you fork, you're going to actually have two stacks and you're going to call irate on each stack independently. So that's how you implement one entry and two exits. There's another model in which you can implement things, which is called the interrupt model. So this is basically you know, how you implement your kernel. In the interrupt model, there's just one kernel stack. Per CPU. So let's say there's just one CPU in your system, then there's just one kernel stack. And so now. Uh, what the kernel needs to do is that it needs to store. So what will happen is that there's just one kernel stack, and uh, that's the value that goes into SS0 and ESP0 that the hardware knows, and, uh, th and that's permanent. And so whenever you enter, you enter on that stack. But you are going to, when you switch, so let's say, you know, when I was, let's say a, a function, a process made a fork system call, and I was executing on the stack, and now I created a new process called child. And now I want it to uh, switch to the child. So what I'll do is I'll save all the contents of the kernel stack in some other data structure and load the contents of the uh, child's stack from his data structure into the stack. Right? So eventually it's the same thing. You basically need separate states in the kernel which simulates a stack per process. Right? In this case, you're, having, you're actually having a separate kernel stack per process. In this case, you actually have only one stack which is visible to the hardware. But internally, you are, uh, you are swapping state to basically fill that stack. Right? In this case, you will actually tell the hardware. So on, on each context switch, you're going to tell the hardware that this is the, this is stack, this is the value of SS0 and ESP0 you should use. Right? On every context switch, you change the hardware structure. In this case, on every context switch, you don't change the hardware structure. You just do this internally. OK? One of them, we only have one CPU, let's assume, OK, and then? So uh, we cannot call them parallelly both the IDs, right? You, yeah, so you cannot, let's say there's just one CPU. So what will happen is one CPU, one process made the fork call. It created a new process. It added it to the list of processes that are possible to run, right? And now let's say the parent continues to run. So parent is going to call IRET, and now parent can continue to run. And then let's say the parent says, I want to get out of the CPU. Or let's say a timer interrupt occurred, and the OS forcibly brings him out of the CPU. And now this process's turn comes, and so now he gets to run, and now he'll call IRET. But uh, at that point, you already popped out all the uh, uh, ESP. No, we popped out things from the parent stack. So we have a separate stack per, per process, right? So we popped out things from the parent stack. The child stack still remains. Okay. 
in the interrupt model, you know, it's basically the same thing, except, I mean, you're basically storing the value with which the stack needs to be initialized when it gets context switched. And you're storing in some data structure, right? So let's say in that process, in the list of processes, you're also saying, you know, this is the, these are the values with which you should initialize the stack before you start it running. Okay. So it, I mean, the, there's no fundamental difference really. In one case, you're exposing it to the hardware. In the other case, you are keeping things internally. Okay, all right, so, uh, yeah, question. Right, so what will happen, so this seems to be confusing people, that what happens in case of one kernel stack? So let's just, this is one kernel stack, all right, but each time you context switch, you are going to reinitialize that kernel stack with certain values, right? And so for, in case of a parent and a child, you store that, you know, this is what you should initialize it before you start running it. Okay, so that's the difference. In the for clearly in the OS address space. So where are these values stored? Clearly in the OS address space. How they are stored in some data structure, which is maintaining the set of all the processes and associated information, right? In any case, when I have a separate kernel stack or process, I'm also storing the stack with the process, right? So this is a, this is your stack, this is my stack, this is his stack, etc. And so I'm going to load the ESP with that stack. In this case, the ESP remains the same. I just initialize the memory locations. That's the only difference. All right? Is it possible to make two copies of the same thing on the same stack? Yes. I, I mean, for, intentionally or unintentionally? Okay, and then why? And, uh, then first time when we call uh, I rate for either child or parent, then we get the uh, first file value, then, then second time when we call, we get second file value. No, it has a lot of problems. So the question is, can, can we use the same stack for both the parent and the child, and uh, actually have two frames, one for the child and one for the parent, and use the same stack and not having to context switch? There are also other processes in the system, right? So, you know, I mean, the cleaner way would be that you basically say that you know this is this is yours, this is how you should initialize things. So other, it's possible that between the parent gets to run and between the child gets to run, there are other processes that get to run in the middle. So you know why would you want to do that? Okay. All right. So your programming assignment, you are you are now roughly ready to actually start on your programming assignment, and you should start on it uh, immediately. Okay. Also, there's a homework due next Thursday. So you should also start looking at it. All right? Okay. So let's stop. <laughs>